think I knew I could say that by myself. Uh, okay, so I am going to talk about two different pieces of work. I've been debating what to talk about, but this, this is what I've settled on. Um, because a number of people have talked about sort of intermediate reward functions of various sorts. So I've sp I spent some time in the last um, few years thinking about where do reward functions come from. And, uh, and one piece of work that we've done that mathematizes it in a particular way is the optimal rewards problem. So I'm going to talk about that. Okay, so we all seen this diagram many times by now. Uh, you have an autonomous agent. This is a usual reinforcement learning diagram in which the reward comes from the environment, from the critic in the environment. And the agent's purpose is to act so as to maximize the expected discounted sum of rewards over some time horizon, right? This is the usual problem, uh, the usual reinforcement learning setting. But I'm going to show you that I think this setting confounds two things, two roles of rewards. So we, I, I can call it many other things, but let's call it the preferences parameters confound. So to, to show this confound, I want to step back and talk about the, the, the more normal engineering setting. Actually, it's also true in biology, just the engineer gets replaced by evolution. So the starting point for this story is that there is an agent designer. That has preferences over agent behavior. Okay, so that's the starting point. Um, so there's, you'll call the agent designer's reward function the objective reward function. And then the question is, what should the agent's reward function be? Remember, it's the agent designer that has preferences over agent behavior. And so if you have a single notion of reward, which is the obvious thing to do would be to take the agent designer's reward function, just give it to the agent. Make the agent's reward function the same as the agent designer's. Because why would you do something different? Well, here's why. Because the reward function for an agent, again, in this setting, plays two roles. One is the reward function is, is, is expresses the preferences of the agent designer. It's used to evaluate the trajectories the agent produces. That's one role. The other role of the reward function is that it guides what the agent actually does. So for example, if the agent is a Q learner, the reward function, the Q learning agent will translate a reward function into behavior. If it's a policy gradient uh, algorithm, it'll translate the given reward function into behavior. So there is two separate roles, one of evaluation and one of guidance. And when we think of the usual RL setting, we confound these two roles. And the question is, can we do better if we don't do this? That's what I'm going to um, try to show. So, so the revised view of the agent is now the following. The diagram on your left is the usual RL diagram. And there's a new diagram, which is to the right, which is where the, there is a notion of a reward function that's internal to the agent, that's built into the agent. So presumably evolution reached into our brains and built a reward function where the evolutionary reward function is, is the usual fitness function. Okay, so let's formalize this problem, which we are called the optimal reward problem. So now there are two reward functions. There's a given reward function, which is the objective reward function, I'm gonna call R sub O, and then a choice of a reward function I'll call R sub i for, for the internal reward function or intrinsic reward function. So what's an agent? An agent is just some function g in this mathematization that has some parameters theta that maps a reward, a given reward R sub i into behavior. So if I can get my cursor to work. So um, you put the agent in an environment and you get a trajectory. The trajectory or interaction is h. The utility to the agent of that trajectory h is given by the sum of the internal rewards. But the thing we truly care about is the utility to the agent designer, which is the sum of the objective rewards. So in this story then, the optimal reward choice, r star i, is the reward from some space of rewards that when given to the agent produces trajectories that end up optimizing the expected objective utility of the agent designer. Okay, so this is the optimal reward problem. It sets up a problem that says, whatever the agent is, so one really nice thing about this uh, way of thinking about the reward problem versus many other ways of thinking about reward problem, right? So uh, shaping people think about reward problem. 
uh, inverse reinforcement learning, people think about where do rewards come from. So there are all these many different ways of thinking about sort of how the, um, where do rewards c could come from. One nice aspect of this is that the agent and its limitations are part of the optimization problem. Right? In fact, the objective reward should be the optimal reward if the agent was somehow unbounded in capacity. Because then it would just do the right thing, right? It's because the agent is limited in some fashion. Limited computationally, limited representationally, limited in the amount of observations it can get, things of that sort, which, which make this optimal reward choice different than the objective reward. Okay, so that's just a setup. And I'm just gonna show you a couple of quick results in this setup, uh, and uh, just to uh, whet your appetite. There are, there are more papers on this uh, where we've pursued this line of thinking and you can read more about it. So here's a very, very simple, I'm gonna show you a toy problem and a result, and then I'm gonna show you our result where we implemented this idea on learning Atari games, which is a much more complex engineering uh, problem. So here's a very contrived problem. You have a little agent that's shown by a circle in a world in which there is fish, and there is bait. Uh, it's complicated to learn to fish. You have to go pick up the bait, you have to walk it to the, with the bait to the fish and not eat the bait along the way and then, then learn to fish. So it's a much more complicated process. Or you can just eat bait, which is not as appetizing and you get a small amount of reward. So in this world, we set up the world in such a way that you can quickly learn how to eat the bait or you can spend more time learning how to use the bait to catch fish, which is much more, much more appealing. Okay, so, uh, so, so um, here's, a, here's a figure. In this figure, I'm showing you um, agent's lifetime on the horizon. So this, is, this should not really be part of the line, it should be part of the points. Um, each point on the horizontal, uh, on the x-axis, is, is a, is a, is a is an agent that, has, that lives only at up to that point of time. So here's an agent that lives, I can't really read these numbers, 4,500 time steps. Here's an agent that lives 4,000 time steps and so on. Okay. And what I'm showing you on the y-axis is the uh, average reward per time step that the agent gets. And let's focus on the blue axis, the blue curve for a minute. The blue curve has um, several interesting points. Here is the lifetime needed to begin to eat fish. Ah, this is complicated. Okay, let's, let me do it this way. Uh, let's look at the, the upper knee, this one. If I just gave the agent the, the objective reward, fish is worth one, eating bait is worth 0 0.04, whatever the numbers were, and I let it do Q learning for that lifespan, the agent has to at least live up to this lifetime in order to learn to fish, to begin to gain that ability to exploit the fish. And that's the difference between the slow eating bait and then faster ramp up with eating, eating, eating fish. If you optimize the reward function, this, this knee can happen much earlier. Okay, so that's the point. So let me just show you pictorially. If the agent is a very short lifespan, the optimal reward says basically, uh, the red reward is a reward for eating bait, internal reward and the blue reward is the reward for eating fish internally. And if you a very short lifespan, all you have to do is, uh, because you almost never get to eat to eating fish, is you have to make the bait slightly rewarding. It doesn't really matter what reward you give fish. If the agent lives longer than this many steps, then it becomes particularly important to actually punish eating fish. Because you don't want the agent to get distracted if it happens to wreck occasionally eat fish. It really should, doesn't have enough time to learn to do that effectively. And so the optimal reward says eating bait is great, eating fish is really bad. It's only after a certain amount of, further amount of time where it becomes possible to really have a long enough life to learn to eat fish properly, and, and then it, it, the, the, it becomes more like the objective reward. Okay, so I, I know I'm going very quickly through this, but just to show you how optimal reward in this, in the optimal choice of reward depends on this agent bound. What is the agent bound in this instance? The amount of learning time it has. Sorry, amount of lifetime it has. 
The shorter the lifespan, in this case, the objective reward becomes, in fact, the opposite, has the opposite polarity to the, uh, to the objective reward. The internal reward has the opposite polarity to the objective reward. Okay. Um, so so the, the overall story is, is the following. Um, you know, if you have an unbounded agent and you just give it the objective reward, it'll achieve a certain amount of value. If you have a bounded agent, like a limited lifetime agent or a shadow planner or whatever the bound is, and you give it the objective reward, or the confounded reward in other words, it has a much lower performance. If you optimize the reward, you can uh, make up the difference. So optimizing reward mitigates agent bounds is a way of saying this, right? You can, you can tune the reward to mitigate the effects of the agent's bound to achieve a better objective utility. Yes? So the fishing comes up, you want to consider the reward, you know, uh, changing the reward, uh, the internal reward function, but the, the external reward function for the states when you consume the fish or the bait. I the picked. General, it's for all states you can define it. Yes. Okay, the general state. Exactly. I'm about to show you an experiment where we did exactly that. So now I'm going to show you a much more interesting experiment where we did this more, you know, in an in a engineering domain. I, I'm sure many of you have already seen pictures like this, but let me just introduce you to the Atari domain. This is Atari domains where DeepMind has popularized this. Uh, they earned about $400 million for their company because they, could, they had agents that could play these games. And I'm only half joking. Uh, so how, what's the RL agent going to do? The RL agent is going to see images like this. These are ancient games, Atari games. Many of you, are, most of you are too young to know about them. Uh, so this is a game, Breakout. Uh, where the panel at the bottom, the images, the, the agent is getting these images and is choosing by through a joystick what action to do. In that case, it's going to go in the bottom panel. In this case, it's shooting and moving uh, left and right. Uh, and the objective of that one is to is to break out, break all these bricks, and you get a score. Okay. So how do you solve these things? You can solve them through reinforcement learning. The algorithm I'm going to talk about is the algorithm called UCT. Uh, the way UCT, it's a state-of-the-art game, one of the state-of-the-art game playing algorithms, is basically a look-ahead search. So you look, you generate trajectories in somewhat slightly clever way that's not really important here, uh, uh, which has two parameters. You, the, the depth of the trajectories that you look ahead and the number of trajectories you generate. So there's two parameters, number of trajectories, depth of trajectories. And you choose these trajectories and, and so you have to take an action in any particular frame, let's say this frame, you look ahead using these trajectories and then decide based on those trajectories what action you do. Okay, so that's the agent. Now, to truly pay really well, you have to do very deep trajectories and very many trajectories, which will make the reaction time, if you like, or the action time very slow. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're going to use this internal reward framework to take an agent that has limited ability to plan, so we bound the number of, the depth and the number of trajectories, but now we can tweak the internal reward function to improve the performance of this bounded UCT agent. And all I'm gonna show you is the conceptual idea of how we can uh, tweak this reward function through a procedure which you call PGRD, and then I'm gonna show you some results. So the, the, the idea is really straightforward. You actually heard about policy gradient algorithms yesterday or day before yesterday, I can't remember now. Um, so the idea is that the one way to think about the internal reward is that the internal reward is effectively a parameterization of a policy. Because once you fix the algorithm, whether it be Q-learning or this look-ahead search algorithm, once you fix the reward, you basically fix what the, what the behavior of the agent will be. So changing the reward changes the behavior. So in other words, the internal rewards are parameters of the agent's policy. Whatever the procedure is, as long as the procedure is differentiable, that you can differentiate through that procedure, you can use gradient methods to update the internal reward. So that's what we do. We, it turns out we can write down a procedure, and I'm just gonna flash it for a minute and not show you really how it works, that, that um, takes the gradient through the look-ahead search tweaks the internal reward into the gradient process so that the UCT look-ahead search planner gets better and better as you improve this internal reward. Okay, so how do we do it? Um, 
you know, it's an ICML paper from this year. But basically, we t but to your point, Matt, I think what we do is we, we take the image and we use a deep layer, uh, the deep, uh, deep neural network to associate each image with an internal reward function. And we add that to the objective score. So it's a bonus uh, kind of uh, internal reward function and use this additive quantity as if that was a reward function in UCT planning. And we're tweaking, when we are doing uh, policy gradient, we are updating all the parameters in this neural network. So it's a, it's a mapping from every possible frame to a internal reward function. And, uh, and again, there's lots of details that I'm glossing over. So I just want to show you the result. If, if, if you find it interesting, we'll, you can certainly find many more details in the paper. So that we did this on 25 Atari games. Uh, here are the 25 games. And what I'm showing you uh, is bars which show the ratio of the performance with and without the internal reward. So you can give the objective reward and do UCT, or you can use this procedure to compute internal rewards and do UCT. And everything to the, so this, this vertical line is at a ratio of one. So in every case where the blue line is on this side, our agent, uh, agent's performance was improved in those games, in some cases significantly by a large, by as, much, as high as, I don't know, 50 or 60 in a, in a multiplicative way. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about um, internal rewards, and I wanted to say something, switch to a different topic. I just had a question. Yeah, please do. Questions at this point so would be good. Is, in my world, uh, I always like to think about internal rewards, some sort of information. I mean, how much, what you estimate your, your the future is going to be based on your current knowledge. Uh, and this is, usually competing with external rewards, which is something like money or energy or whatever. And I, somehow, I'm wondering if, there's, if you see any connection like this, or it's completely different story. So the story that at least I'm saying, and I think there must be a connection at some deeper level, and we can spend a few minutes on it if you like. The story I'm saying is, think of the agent as a procedure for converting these numbers, these, this function, this internal reward function into behavior. Now, it could be a learning algorithm, it could be a planning algorithm, it could be whatever the algorithm is. If it's a reinforcement learning algorithm, its behavior is at least influenced by the reward function. So now the question is, in this separation we've done between the objective reward, not between state estimation control, between the objective reward and the internal reward, that sets up an optimization problem. How should I set these numbers so that the resulting behavior optimizes the overall uh, the true reward we care about. So, but I think to your point, that I think the way to connect it to your point is that, as, as I was trying to make the claim, that the, what these internal rewards are going to do are going to mitigate some kind of limitation the agent has. They're going to undo a limitation a little bit. Um, and in that sense, I think, if you think of that more formally, it may be that it connects to information theoretic uh, quantities. So it's with that connection. It's different than the belief state and the true state. I mean, how much uh, you think you know about the world, but how much you read. Right. Much you want your internal reward function to be sensitive to whatever limitations, inaccuracies you have about what you think you know. You, you, you have your hand up. Yeah, so the, the reward, the internal reward, you, you still want to optimize the objective. Reward, yes. It's not clear in what sense the, the internal reward makes the agent stronger, right? In terms of the parameter, like the parameterized, action is still the same, right? So does it help in terms of optimization, like overcoming local optima, or what, what do you think? So let me give you a more concrete example. So we did a little toy world, and I should have put pictures of that, in which, let's say the reward, so you're planning, you're looking ahead, you're looking ahead. Um, but let's imagine your look ahead is not deep enough to encounter the true sources of reward. So let's say, picture in your head a rat in a maze, there's cheese at some place, the rat's planning, uh, and, and it can't look deep enough in this model understanding of the world that it, it knows what to do to get to the cheese. So, so now the planner is just gonna fail, right? Because it, it ne never sees the cheese, everything looks boring, and it could behave randomly. This is the objective reward, if, it gave, if I gave it the objective reward. Now imagine you can give it an internal reward, that says, it's good to go to places you haven't been to. I'm making up an internal reward, right? So now what the rat will do is it'll at least 
try to go to places, they'll have this internal intrinsic motivation to explore, which is more likely to lead it towards cheese than otherwise. As an example. But if the learning algorithm is optimal, then that ah. will happen, right? So it's, it's ah. something about the algorithm. Yes. This is exactly, it's exactly right, which is why I'm saying this view treats the algorithm as given and fixed. It's and crucial. But, but, but that's always the case. It's only in theoreticians' heads that the algorithms are not so often, right? It, yes? Can you see the very concept of computing a value function as, as the instantiation of this idea that essentially, you know, if you say that, okay, what, what should be my internal reward if I want the greedy algorithm yes. to perform value? Yes. I want to compute the value. Yes. So that's right. So exactly right. So suppose I had a one step, it had no look ahead algorithms. Then, or greedy algorithms, then the, the optimal internal reward would be, would be the value function, which of course is the entire computation. So, so we don't want to be in that situation, right? We, I'm in the intermediate situation where I'm not being greedy, right? Right. Any other questions? How much time do I have? Sorry. No, I don't have time because I have a, but I just want to be, no, I want to know how much time do I have. Okay. So in that setting, the agent bound was a lifetime bound, and the and the agents were learning agents. So the shorter the lifetime. But you can consider maybe the case where the lifetime agent is learning agents, and the reward Yes, that would be a different. So we have done some experiments uh, where we do the evolutionary story computationally. Uh, where those sorts of things play a role. We've also done some experiments where, to your point, where um, it's the belief state estimation that's limited. And then how do you use internal rewards to mitigate that? Uh, but I think, again, to you, uh, going back to your point, this is a view where we're not allowed to change the algorithm. We're assuming somehow that the algorithm is fixed. It's somehow suboptimal and fixed, and we get to change. The only thing we get to change is the reward function. So. So I don't know what more to say about your case. But we did do some of that work in, in the evolutionary, evolutionary setting. OK, so now I'm going to talk about something completely different. Um, but I want to connect to some of the, the neuroscience people, not at the level of uh, results, but of the kind of recording results, but at the level of architecture. One of the really fascinating things that's happening in the world of deep reinforcement learning right now is that we're beginning to explore architectures that are very much architectures that um, neuroscientists uh, and cognitive architecture people study. So I'm going to take a domain, the domain of Minecraft, um, and I'm going to show you some problems in which we explore architectures of the sort that I think are, are intuitively sensible to people who think about brain architectures. OK, so um, I'm going to skip this. I'm just going to show you the domain first. This is all about why deep reinforcement learning is so exciting. If you, if you want me to tell you about that, you can ask me about it. Um, so, so why Minecraft? How many of you know what Minecraft is? I guess all the young people do. I guess people with kids also do. Kids are playing Minecraft. Um, so the nice thing about Minecraft, it's open source right now, and we can, we can, we can design our own domains. Um, the thing I'm most interested in is I'm interested in domains in which I can control the amount of partial observability the agent has and the amount of generalization it needs to do uh, in, in, uh, to larger and different versions of the domain. I'll show examples in a minute. Um, the other really interesting thing about Minecraft is that it has this interaction of active perception and active use of memory. So in Minecraft, the agent has a first person view. It can look up, look down, look this way, look that way, and it sees where it's face it. So it can, it can deal with incomplete information by looking for things, by looking at things. So active perception as a way of dealing with partial observability, but also, uh, as I'm going to show you, uh, we're going to build architectures that have memory and allow, and that also uh, in, interacts with these sort of things. OK. So let me show you, show you a domain. This is a very simple domain. It's a maze domain um, in which this is the aerial view of the agent acting in the world. But really, the agent is getting images like that. So that's the images that the agent is getting. Uh, let me just pause 
Let me just pause this for a minute. Um, so, so the agent's task is, in this I, what we call I maze, is it's always born at the, big, at the top of the um, maze. It has to look to see if there's a green patch at the end of the corridor. And if there's a green patch, it has to go to the blue patch, I think, to get a reward. And if there is no green patch, it has to go to the red to get, to get a reward. Something like that. I can't remember the exact. Depending on the indicator of green and yellow, it has to go to the blue. But again, the agent just gets his visual perception, right? So it, can't, it has to somehow deal with the fact that it, it can't always see, as it moves down the corridor, whether it was a green patch or a yellow patch. Again, the agent's view is like that. This is just our aerial view for us to see what's going on. And I'll show you other domains, more, more interesting domains in a minute. So basically what we did is we explored certain kinds of architectures. So let me walk you through the architectures one by one. So here's the simplest architecture. It's what a deep mind used to play a card game. It's called a DQN. It's called a deep Q network. And the idea is you give it the last M frames. Last, it, it's sort of at the memory of the last M frames. And then it learns to associate that memory, that memory of the last four frames, to a Q map. And I want to explain. If you don't know what Q learning is, I apologize. This is, uh, we've been talking about reinforcement learning for this workshop, so hopefully have enough of that context in it. Okay, so this is the DQN architecture. Here's a slightly different architecture in which the last layer of representation is a recurrent connection. So now you can even just view the last image because it has this ability, the recurrent connection, to remember to, to accumulate state from previous images because the next context is a function of the previous context plus the latest observation. So that's a a different architecture that then associates to Q values. So here's, here are three more. Here's one in which we give the agent an external register of memory. And it can store things, it can encode things into memory, and it can retrieve things from memory. And the Q function now, the value function, depends both on this abstracted context, but also on the contents of memory. So that's architecture C. Architecture D, again, puts a recurrence on the context. So it allows both an external memory, but also a context representation that can, can accumulate things over some time. The final architecture allows the context, the next context to depend not only on the previous context and the current image, but also the previously retrieved memory, which is that downward arrow. So you get richer and richer architectures. Yes? Uh, I'm a bit confused. The memory is storing the context from the previous time steps? No, no, no. The, no. The, yeah, this diagram is an abstracted view, and I apologize. So the, the memory is just a register of set of, mem uh, you know, a set of registers. You can push vectors into them, and you can retrieve vectors from them. OK? So the way to think about it is not that, so the, the fact that there's an arrow from context to memory is just showing you that the, con the retrieval from memory is, co is contextual. So I can use context to retrieve things from memory. Okay? That's what that arrow is showing. Yes? Are there like specific uh, actions associated with writing context out of the Good. Is there Good. Is the difference that the other arrows are always happening, whereas that arrow is yes. an action? Yes. So there are many, many things one can do. One can write smartly, read smartly. Uh, the architecture we're doing uh, writes all way, writes the last k things, it just retrieves smartly. So retrieval is smart, is contextual, but the writing is just encoding the last uh, last m things or whatever the n things. Okay. So the, the point is, of course, context matters, right? When and this is a different problem, but again, depending on the color here, it has to either uh, go in a particular order from blue to red, or if the color is different, then it has to go from red to blue. Any case, the point is, it really only needs to retrieve this color when it is in front of one of these colors, because then it has to make a decision. Right? So there's an appropriate retrieval that needs to happen. OK, I want to just, and I already described the fact that there are, uh, there's a smart context-dependent retrieval, but writing, is, in this case, is not that, in, not that clever. Okay, in order to leave some time for, for, um, 
for discussion, I'm just going to show you some results. So this is the IMAZE problem. Um, let me just show you videos again of this. Uh, this one's interesting probably to show. Okay, so let's look at the IMAZE memory retrieval visualization. So at the beginning of time, uh, it sees this. So what, what you'll see as I click is you will see the memory retrieval cues, or where it's retrieving its memory from. So it's storing all those images in memory. And, and as I expand this, you will see where and when it's, re it's, it's doing its retrieval from. So I keep going along time, and basically it, it never retrieves the color at the beginning, except the first time when it begins to see a color, the red color, then it puts a lot of weight on this storage stored thing and retrieves it. So that becomes available for that Q value function. Because the Q value function is a function of the retrieved memory and context. And so then it can learn. Okay, so I'm just going to show you videos of it if it's succeeding. Uh, by the way, and also generalizing, you only train it on small maps and then it and then it learns to uh, on maps. It learns to do the right thing. So basically, it learns a simple strategy, right? Part of, part of the motivation of this is that you can use external memory to basically learn simple programs. The simple program it learns is see the color at the beginning, turn to the appropriate color, turn to that side, look at the color, store it, walk to the end of the corridor, retrieve the color, and then decide which way to go and done. So it just learns to graded procedures how to do this way. OK, Here was, here's another one. This is a domain in which there are two rooms. The agent is born in the middle. The, and it has to, if the room has the same patterns, then it should go to the red, I think. If the room has different patterns, go to, go to, go to uh, blue. So this is actually a pretty complicated task in some, in some ways. I'm going to show you it working. Um, basically, what it does is it looks at both the rooms. It doesn't have to enter the rooms. It, the rooms are close enough that it can see the entire pattern by just looking towards the room. And it, and it has to do this computation inside its memory, using its memory. Are those two patterns the same or not? When it gets to the end of the corridor, it has to use that ability to, to go to the red or the blue. And it basically learns to do that. And I, we did more complicated random mazes. And it, and it learns a pretty general, general strategy. OK, I'm going to stop with this. Um, and here's just, I'm going to let this visualization show and let you ask questions. So the, the point of this second part of the talk, let me connect it to other themes that people have been talking about. So one of the themes that has been around is what is you know, state estimation. If you get a sequence of observations, how do you estimate state? So in reinforcement learning, there are three ways of thinking about estimating state. And you saw examples of at least two of them in this last piece of work. One is what, say, the Atari game people did. Just take the last K images, last K observations, Treat them as state. So that's basically you're assuming the world is a case order Markov process. It's not likely to be true. Turns out many Atari games actually it is true, because all it is is you know you need two frames to detect velocity, to detect, to detect direction of movement. So, like example, breakout is basically second order Markov. But it's a pretty standard thing to do. You assume the last k observations were state. That's one approach. The other approach is this recurrent neural net approach, where you build up a representation of state through some, uh, you know, some sort of uh, function of history, where the next context is a function of the previous context of the latest observation. Right? That's a simple kind of, uh, you, and you learn that, that mapping, and that becomes your representation of state. A third one, which is much more complicated, which people rarely use, is to do the belief state calculation. That's only done in toy problems. Almost no one does that in any real world problem. Those are the three classes of approaches that most people know about. There's actually a fourth class, which is, has to do with critical state representations. But that's much more complicated to explain, and I won't, and I won't do that. But probably it connects most deeply to stuff that Tali thinks about. So I want to just at least connect these things. Yeah. But the point of this work was to show that there's a lot of exciting things going on in deep reinforcement learning. You heard about that yesterday uh, as well. Tom was driving. Um, we're exploring lots of different things.